What's up guys, it's Parallax Abstraction and welcome to PXA Peaks at Res Infinite. Oh, I am really excited to show this off to you guys and on the PC to boot, which I honestly didn't think was going to happen. So Res Infinite actually originally came out on the PlayStation 4 as a launch title for PlayStation VR and everybody just assumed that it was locked down by Sony and that we weren't going to see it anywhere else. And then just a couple of days prior to launch, Enhanced Games came out and said, oh yeah, it's coming to the PC, by the way, here you go. And everyone was like, what? So I reached out to Enhanced to see if I could get press code, which I honestly thought thought was a long shot because I figured I was too small time for them but they got back to me within like two hours and were like no absolutely here you go so thank you to them for that because I've really wanted to talk about this so Res is a game that originally came out for the Dreamcast and the PlayStation 2 and it's since got a, a sort of an HD upscaling on the Xbox 360 and now we have Res Infinite which is the original game upscaled further including an additional area and Res is a really unique thing. So it comes to us from Tetsuya Mizuguchi, who is a rather well-known, but sort of small time, I guess you'd say, Japanese game designer. He makes almost exclusively music-based games. He did the original Res for Sega under their United Game Artists label, which is long since defunct. And then he went and started a company called Q Entertainment, which made things like Luminous, which is a game a lot of people probably remember. They also made Child of Eden, which was kind of a spiritual successor to this that Ubisoft put out that completely bombed. And they did the Meteos games and some other stuff. Most, Almost everything they've made is really good and ties into music in a really interesting way because Mizuguchi is actually an electronic musician in his own right. And... Res is something, well, we're going to get into it a little bit more here, but I'm going to sort of give you the basics uh, of what this game is, why I think it's unique, why despite never being hyper popular, it has a very devoted fan base, and why I think this is really, really might be interesting to check out. So just FYI, I am not playing this in VR, obviously. The PC version does have full native support for the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. I do not have access to one of those, though I have been told the VR is quite good. I've asked some friends of mine who do have VR to try this out, but they have not at time of recording. So we're just playing it in straight old flat mode here, but that's still quite something. So yeah, we're going to show you this here. So... The base game of Res is the original game, um, basically upscale with nicer assets. Area X is the area that was actually added to Res Infinite. We're going to show you that later because it actually runs as a separate executable because while the base game of Res is done in the in-house Synesthesia engine, which is what it was originally developed on and has been ported forward over time, Area X is actually done in Unreal Engine 4. Uh, and it looks very different from the rest of the game, but it actually runs as a separate executable that I have to capture separately, so we're going to show you that later. Uh, but also, amazingly enough, the PC port of this is exceptionally good. Until very recently, Japanese PC ports are typically pretty bad, uh, basically because the PC is not a very popular gaming platform in Japan. Consoles kind of rule the roost over there. But in recent years, Japanese developers have gotten much better at the PC uh, space, and this is no exception. So this is co-developed by two teams called Monstars and Resonair, neither of whom I've ever heard of, but they worked with Enhanced Games to, to put this out on PC. And as you can see, there's a good number of options here. Again, because Area X is a separate engine, you have to uh, configure it separately. But I'm playing this, admittedly, on a beast. I'm playing this on an overclock 6700K with a GTX 1080. I'm running at 1080p because that's what my monitors support, but I have a 2.5 resolution upscale. So this is running at like, I don't know what it is. It's not 4K, but it's like 2.5K. Digital Foundry actually did an excellent video on this that you should check out. You can play this on a GTX 970 or an RX 290 on at 4K natively if you want. On a GTX, or on a, what was it, a Titan XP, they managed to get this thing up to like 16K and still played at 60 frames a second, which is insane. But it's definitely something this game requires. One little bugbear I have, at least in the version of this I played at time of recording, it maybe has been patched since. If you turn VSync on and you have a high refresh rate monitor like I do, that can run at 144 frames a second, the game runs basically twice as fast uh, because it tries to, the gameplay is tied to the frame rate. And if you go to VSync, which forces the game to run at higher than 60 frames a second on my configuration, it's basically unplayably fast. So there's a little, little thing about that. And of course you can see there's VR settings here, which I can't do because I ain't got VR. 
All right, so enough babbling about that. So yes, the this is the base game of Res, which takes place, as I said, on the Synesthesia engine, which still looks very good. So you have the core play mode, there's a score attack mode, there is traveling, which is kind of like a relaxed, uh, super easy mode, where you can go through all but the final area. They also have Beyond, which are some additional little... Uh, experiences that were put in that were not in the original version. Uh, I actually have a PS2 copy of this game sitting on the shelf, which is worth real money because it didn't sell very well back in the day, and none of these things were in there. So there's Direct Assault, which as you can see, an assault on all areas in order from start to finish. There's no level breaks. There's Lost Area, which is an interesting level. It was kind of a concept level. It has no boss in it, but they made it a, a score attack mode. And you can see here there's Transmission, which uh, you have to beat the high score for Lost Area, which I have not done. And there's also Boss Rush, which is achieve a shot down rate of 95% in all areas of the play mode, which I have also not done, though I have come close. So I've beaten the game. I actually played this on stream the other night. It's not a very long game, and it's not super hard either, unless you want 100% it. But we're going to jump right in here, and I'm going to show you how this works. So, okay. So, this game is... At its core, this is one of those things that I don't hesitate to call a true audio-visual experience because that's really what it is. It has gameplay mechanics, it most certainly is a game, but it's not particularly hard and it's not particularly long. But it is a real trip to play, and that's kind of the 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 core thing about it here. Uh, it, it, it at its core is an on-rail shooter, so very much like Panzer Dragoon or something like that. Uh, you are not you you're controlling your target and you have some basic movement control over your character and that you can turn around in in some certain cases but it's not re really free roaming movement your the core thing you're controlling here is your target your aiming target now uh, I am playing this with an Xbox one controller the game does work fine with a mouse but you have to keep in mind that in order to not break the flow of gameplay the mouse speed is restricted to the maximum speed a controller would be at because because of the way the enemies move and the way the patterns work you have to be able to move the target at the same speed or you'd kind of break the gameplay so just so you're aware of that it feels a little weird at first because you might feel that the mouse is supposed to be moving faster than it is but you do get used to it and it does work well but controller is the way this game was originally built so that's what i'm doing so you see here you're taking out enemies and you're there's music cues associated with everything you do in this game so whether you press the button with no target selected you can hear i'm doing that there and then you see you just paint over targets you can fire up to 10 bullets at a time and you're just sort of hovering over the targets to sort of paint the the uh the enemies that you want to shoot you hold down the a button to paint them and then when you let go you fire and that's kind of it in this core story mode there's not much more to it than that. It's So there is a scoring system in the score attack mode, but not in the core mode, the core story mode like this. And there's no bonuses for combos. There's no anything like that. It's really just you're making things a little easier on yourself by comboing enemies. In the score attack mode, there most certainly is score associated with that. But as you can see here, we're going into different layers. So each level has 10 different layers that you progress through. And the way you get there is the sort of breach, breach to the layer is that little box that will appear. Sometimes it's very quick, as you can see. So you can either take the box, if you take the box out it quickly, you will get to the next layer. And each layer puts on an additional, well, layer of the song, as you're hearing here. The song is sort of evolving as we go. And everything we're doing here has a musical trigger to it. So targeting enemies, shooting at the enemies, hitting the enemies, the enemies dying, things like that. Everything has a little musical cue to it. So you're kind of creating and almost remixing the song as you're playing it. But you don't have to, again, you don't have to do things a certain way. You don't have to make the music sound a certain way to be playing it right. That's why I really call this sort of an audio visual experience. You're playing this you can sort of play this just to sort of blast your way through the level as fast as you can, take out the enemies as fast as possible, and that's it. Or you can try to time your, your shots and your your enemy targeting and whatnot a little bit more to the beat and sort of make, it, make the music sound a little bit more like a coherent song that you're composing on the fly. But you can choose to play it however way you want. Neither way is wrong. 
You can also choose there. So you see I've been hitting those layer triggers as they come up, but you don't have to hit them either. If you want to get 100% of what's called analyzation, you do have to, to hit them as fast as possible, but you can just keep going if you want. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do have to hit them that quickly. But as you can see, we're moving through the level pretty quick. There's 10 layers, and on the 10th layer is a boss. Now, you're also seeing two other things there. You see there's two meters down there. So overdrive is very simple. It's kind of like when you're playing a shmup and you have the bomb button that you can use to rapidly clear enemies on the screen. That's essentially what this is. So if you're getting a little overrun, because enemies, if you don't take them out quick enough, will shoot at you, obviously. Uh, and you can die in this. So if, if you're getting a little overwhelmed, you can press the B button. And I'll show you here when we get a, uh, a few more enemies on the screen here. As you can see, this is all very good beady Japanese EDM in this game. So you see here, for example, if I press B here. So you see the enemies are spawning in and they're getting taken out automatically as long as that power up goes on. That's what Overdrive does. And then the meter on the left side is your is basically your evolution gauge. So every time I pick up one of those little blue power ups that you've been seeing around the levels, that gauge goes up. When you max it out, you evolve into another cyber, another level of your cybernetic life form, which means you can take more uh, an additional hit. So you will every time you get hit by an enemy, you will devolve down until your final your last form, which is you essentially look like a ball, kind of like the the Metroid Morph Ball. And if you take a hit then you're dead and the level's over you have to start over there's no lives you lose when you're in a level you start the level over so now here comes the boss and you see the thing changes so you're obviously seeing what this looks like here so i haven't really talked about the story in this the story in this is kind of threadbare and throwaway and it really just justifies the the aesthetic setting that you're in so essentially what you're doing is playing you're in a world where there's massive overpopulation and everybody kind of lives in cyberspace now i mean it's a, it's a sort of sci-fi dystopian story the like of which we've heard frequently to be honest and there's an ai that is kind of in charge of everything in the world and what's interesting about this is you are trying to work with this a against this AI, but not in the way you might think. So in almost every story like this, right, you have AIs that, that have gone rogue and are threatening to destroy humanity and everything else. This is not the case here. In this universe, the AI is actually um, an AI that, that was built to sort of manage humanity and to try to, to keep track of everything and sort of help humanity thrive and survive. And she basically got overwhelmed with so much data and so many paradoxes that she doesn't want to live anymore and she doesn't think she can go on living knowing what she knows and you're actually trying to prevent her from destroying herself and so you're sort of hacking through the different layers to try to get to the center of this AI to prevent her from from uh, destroying herself and taking over things. It's an interesting concept, but it's not really fleshed out. There's very little narrative storytelling in this. There's a little bit of visual storytelling in the last level, but even then it's not very significant. And the ending to the game, it's almost a non-ending. So the, you, don't, you don't come to this for the story. I mean, all the fiction I just told you is also laid out in a series of slides. That's basically all it is. There's no cutscenes, there's no anything like that, so. The story is a neat idea, but it never really goes, it's never really told to, in a significant way. And that's kind of it, honestly. There's no additional weapons, there's no special weapons beyond the overdrive, there's no anything like that. It's, it's a very simple on-rail shooter. And you may think, well, that sounds pretty weak as a game, and this game is $30, so you're kind of like, well, I mean, yeah, maybe you can see, you're kind of going, well, I see why nobody bought this back in the day. And I can understand that. To be honest with you, this is not something that's for everybody. This game has come out in many different forms over the years, but it's never really sold big numbers. And frankly, most of what Mizuguchi's made has not really sold big numbers. You know, Child of Eden, which was a spiritual successor to this, uh, that he made that way because uh, Sega actually owned Res until recently, so Mizuguchi couldn't make a Res 2. Uh, so he made uh, Child of Eden, which was very much a, a spiritual successor to this. That game was a flop. Uh, and Q Entertainment went out of business because a lot of what Q Entertainment made was a flop, with the exception of Luminous. And yeah, that's the thing. It's it, it, this is a very niche thing. This is a game that you're going to play through to experience it. And if you want to play it again for the score attack, you certainly can. But a lot of people don't. And uh, yeah, to play a game like this that you can beat in maybe an hour for thirty dollars is a tough proposition. 
But the fan base that this game has is rabid, and I'm among them. And I, I admit, it is expensive. It, there is no doubt of that. So here we go. This first boss is going down. We're not going to get super far into this because I... If this looks cool to you, you should really experience it yourself. So, all right, and you get your little stats breakdown here when you beat this. But the thing with this game is it's the presentation of it that's amazing. I mean, you're seeing the visuals here, right? Like, I'm very much a fan of this neon, blown-out, Tron-like aesthetic. This is really my jam. And it, it, it's a simplistic art style, but it really conveys that sort of hard computer, sort of 90s VR cyberpunk type of ideal that I, I just love that. And I love electronic music, and I love games that do electronic music well. And this most certainly does. So we'll go on to Area 2 here, and then I'll show you Area X after that. All right, here we go. So each area has a very distinctive visual flavor to it, and is based around a, a very different sounding electronic track. Uh, they, all the areas are very different from each other, and they, they tend to vary in difficulty. Some are harder than others, and not necessarily always, you know, each level in successive order is harder than the last one has been my experience. But uh, it's a very different different audio-visual experience that you're going to have with each level. There's no doubt about that. And you can see here there's various different enemy types. There's flying enemies. Well, they all sort of fly, but some of them are sort of like these weird carrier ship-looking things. You know, as you can see, it's... it's uh, quite a wide variety, and you can see here my perspective's changing, it's sort of whipping me back and forth to deal with these enemies in different orders. And... Yeah, it's a... It, it's really just the experience of the game, and I personally have played this multiple times over and would continue to, but it's a lot to ask for $30. I, and I, I can appreciate the value proposition is going to be a little rough for some people. Even with, like, even the Area X add-on that they made for this, I'm going to show it to you. It looks amazing. But it's also very short, and it's only one level. The rumor is that the Area X was created to sort of prototype the idea of what a Res 2 could look like if this sold well enough that Mizuguchi could be allowed to make it. Uh, I certainly hope he can, but who knows if that's going to happen. So, this is not for everybody, but the thing that I find fascinating about this is any, you know, sort of the, one of the main things about the video game industry that, you know, most people don't like, and for pretty good reason, is that anything that has even a modicum of success tends to get copied. For every game that, that has succeeded to even a tiny degree, there are always a, a, an army of imitators, right? And this game was not a hit, but its its fan base, as I said, is very devoted. A lot of niche music games like this do tend to have very small but very, very loyal fan bases who will advocate for them. But the thing that I, I find fascinating about Rez from a historical perspective even is that it has, there, it, it has never really been imitated. There has never been another game like this one. There's been plenty of music games made. There's even been some on-rails music games made, but there's been nothing like this made since. The only, the only games that, that resemble Res in even a, a, a tertiary, you know, remotely similar capacity were made by Tetsuya Mizuguchi. You know, no one has, no one has tried to make their own imitation of Res. No indie dev, no, uh, you know, mid-grade team, nothing like that. No one has ever tried to make an imitation of this. Everyone who's made a music game has either tried to make something that plays a little bit more like Rock Band or even the older harmonics games like Amplitude and things like that. No one has ever tried to make an on-rails shooter that looks like this. And I've always found that fascinating. It, because because this game has such a rabid fan base, you know, I've always asked, is it because no one, like, people have tried and no one's managed to duplicate the feel so they've never got it done? Or if people just thought, this is so niche, no one's going to be interested? I don't know. Like, the closest thing I could think of to this that came out recently that I talked about a little while ago was Arrow. And really, Arrow's nothing like this. A Arrow... Arrow is an on-rails music game, but it has it, it, it's really its own thing. It has nothing to do with this. And that's what I find really, really neat, is that no one... It's just... You know, you hear the phrase, often imitated, never duplicated. Well, this has never even really been imitated. Um... And it's always been, despite the fact that, you know, one of the things I love about Tetsuya Mizuguchi as a designer is he's never, 
he's frankly never had large-scale commercial success before, with the exception of Luminous, and that was, some people would say, as good a game as I think Luminous is, some people say that's a case of fortunate timing. But even despite the fact that he's never really had hardcore success, he's always continued to do what he loves. And he's a guy who very clearly isn't in it for the money. Because, you know, after Q Entertainment folded, what did he do? He went and formed Enhanced Games and bought the Res IP from Sega. Or at the very least, licensed it. I don't know if he actually owns it, but I, I, I want to say he does now. And, you know, he went, out, he went out and got it and made another Res. Every attempt he's done at Res has not sold very well outside of its very devoted fan base. But he's continued to go, you know what, I love Rez, and my, you know, my loyal fans love Rez, so I'm gonna keep plugging away at it, and I'm gonna make it. I find that really admirable. And it's one of the reasons I really like to, to, to support him, and the fact that, yeah, I do like on-rail, I do like on-rail shooters, I do like shmups, and this one is very unique in that vein, uh, which is something I, I enjoy as well. But, you know, this has been a 20 minute video already just because, not so much because this is a hard game to show you or it takes a long time to show you, but talking about the history of this game and the fandom behind it takes almost as much time as explaining the core game itself. And that's something you don't necessarily... Whoa, here we go. You know, that that's something you don't see every day where I have to explain the, the history behind a, a niche game like this as opposed to you know, the, the, uh, as opposed to just the game mechanics themselves, which I find kind of fascinating. But yeah, I mean, as someone who, who as I've said before, is a mechanics focused gamer first, you know, I, I will play a good game long before I play a bad game with a good story. This has a cool concept for a story, but barely has any actual meat to it. Uh, this, this game is almost entirely mechanics focused. And that's probably why I like it so much, because it is a very... It is not hard, it is not long, but it is very, very polished and does on-rails game mechanics in a way no one has done before or since, which is something that I find really incredible. So, all right, so we're at this other boss here. You know what? I think I'm just going to back out of here now. As I've said, if this looks interesting to you, you should just go play this and not have me spoil it for you. But uh, yeah, what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you guys Area X, which looks, is just, you got to see this thing. So I got to launch into another game and start capturing again. So give me two seconds and I'll be right back. All right. And here we are in Area X. So again, this is a new section that was done in Unreal Engine 4. And you're going to see that, that this is not just a modern engine or an old engine scaled up to modern systems. You are going to see, yeah, this is a modern game engine. This level is all about the particle effects, and boy does it use them to an incredible degree. This is really like playing a fireworks display, is the best way I can describe it. It's absolutely breathtaking. I, the, when I first sat down, I'd never seen Area X on purpose before I sat down and played it, because I never bought this on the PlayStation, because I intended to one day, frankly, when it got cheaper, because I didn't have PlayStation VR, and I was like, well, I'm like, I love Res, but I don't know if I was willing to pay $30 for it. I keep saying $30. I think it's actually $25 on the PC, at least at launch. But uh, I think it was $30, at least in Canada, on the PlayStation 4. And I was like, I don't want to pay $30 for Res. I'll wait till it gets cheaper. As much as I love Res, I think that's a little bit much. And to be honest with you, I probably would. If I didn't get review code for this on the PC, I would have still paid full price for it just because I'd like to support this on PC because I just love to see Mizuguchi support the PC platform more in the future as well. And I like to support quality Japanese ports to send the message that, hey, you know, you make a good port and PC gamers will show up for it. Now I kind of wish I had bought this on the PlayStation 4 originally because boy was I missing out. So this area is not very long and I'm not gonna spoil this a lot either, but you can just see the, this is just a friggin' mind trip. It's so gorgeous. And I really love the track that's in this uh, area as well. I think this is, this is my favorite track is still the area one track, but I think this is probably my second favorite to be honest. Not it, bo both the bass track itself and the way the cues the, the action cues integrate into it. It's just, it's just a thing of beauty. 
Uh, and, I mean, just look at the way this comes out. Like, these guys use the... I, they certainly couldn't have done this on their old engine. I see why they, they licensed Unreal 4 just for this section. And as I said, music, uh, the rumor is, the hint was that they were, they were were that this Area X was supposed to be a proof of concept for what they might do with a Res 2 if they get the opportunity. My hope is that if the, that this is selling well enough that they could do that. My hope is that... They didn't end up porting this to PC because this didn't sell on the PlayStation 4 and they need to try to make more money to get their money back. I mean, I'm kind of honestly surprised that Sony didn't lock down the exclusivity on this on PS4. Uh, I wonder if something happened with that. I wonder if maybe if they didn't hit a certain sales target or something, Mizuguchi was able to take the game with him some, to another platform. I have no idea. Uh, you know, it's only speculation, but... God, I hope he gets to make a res too, because dude, look at this. Like, how can you not be impressed with this, at least from a visual perspective? I, oh, I absolutely love this. Okay, but that said, I mean, I'm fanboying out on this pretty hard, and it, ab I absolutely love this game. I mean, PXA Peaks is a first impression series, but not only have I finished this, I pretty much knew a lot of what I was going to expect going in, having played the original res. And I love the original res, so I knew I would like this, assuming the port wasn't crap, and I knew from Digital Foundry that it wasn't. But I will freely admit that this game is not for everyone. That's why it didn't sell. That's why it's never really sold that well. This is simply not something that's built for every player. It's for people who like a specific type of game. It is for people who like who like things that are, yeah, maybe a little bit expensive for what you get from a gameplay perspective. This is for some, uh, this is for people who like shmup. I think shmup players would actually really like this because like shmups, this is a game that's designed to be played over and over again, not only to re-experience it, but to perfect it. You, you, ultimately, you, your goal with a game like this is not just to finish it, but, but perfect it. And that's not something for everybody. You know, when it comes to a lot of other games, I'm a one and done kind of player. I'll play the game to completion and then I move on and I never touch it again. But this is very much an exception for that. And uh, I think you really, I think it's really, it's a very special type of game and it is a niche, but I would love to see it become more than that because you can just feel that this is a game that's had so much love and care put into it. And it, on, uh, you can tell this is made by someone who is just passionate about the art he's making. And as has been demonstrated repeatedly, Mizuguchi isn't necessarily in this for the money. He doesn't necessarily care if this game sells a hajillion copies. He just wants to make something unique and cool that you can point to and say, yeah, that like, you can look to from across a room and go, yeah, that's Rez. Yeah, that's a Mizuguchi game. And boy, has he ever done that. Um, because as I said, it, it's so rare to see a game that's had even a tiny little bit of success not, like, not be imitated ever, which this never has been. And it's, it's a really refreshing and, and interesting thing to see. But you've seen the core of it here. It is an on-rail shooter that is based around tying uh, unique audio and visual together. It's very much an art piece. But honestly, it's a hell of a lot more of a game than a lot of quote-unquote arty games are. And it is a game that is still focused around being a game first that also has to be a piece of art. And I've always said in my critiques of things like walking simulators that that is key. If you're not making a good game first, you're failing as a game designer. Your game has to be good and fun to play, and then everything else can follow with that. And Mizuguchi understands that. He, you know, he's making a good game first that happens to be art at the same time, not art first. And that's that's critical. So, but yeah, you've, you've seen a lot of it here. There's no multiplayer in this. There are leaderboards for the score attack mode, but there's no multiplayer. There's uh, no heavy story. It's not very long. And yes, it is expensive, but there's nothing else like it. And it's something that I can happily play again and again and still find fascinating and mesmerizing each time. And I think that says a lot. So yeah, that is Res Infinite, developed by Enhanced Games, uh, Monstars, and Resonair, and published by Enhanced Games in 2017. It is on the PlayStation 4, but this is the PC version that we're checking out. It is an excellent port. It is approximately $25 US on Steam. I can't recommend it enough. If after looking at this, it doesn't turn your crank, I totally understand, but I hope it does, and I really want enough people to buy this to get a res, so that we get a res 2. Please let there be a res 2. Please. 
Thanks for watching, everybody. If you liked what you saw here, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. That does help me out a great deal. If you want to watch something else, check out the videos on screen now, and don't forget to follow at PXA Media on Twitter to find out about new stuff first.